Hi, my name is Kathleen Pitvorek, and I'm the lead author for Sixth Grade Everyday Math, the Common Core Edition. And I'd like to tell you about some changes that we've made for sixth grade to bring it into alignment with the Common Core. So Common Core Standards divides the sixth grade content into five domains. The first three are major work for the grade level, and the last two are supporting and additional work for the grade level. And there have been some changes in each of those domains. So let's start out with one of the major work domains, ratios and proportional relationships. And in this domain, it's always been a strong strand in everyday math from the beginning of the program, and it still is a strong strand in everyday math. However, there are some differences in the way we treat the language in the earlier editions of everyday math, distinguishing it from the Common Core. So we've gone in and we've revised lessons to make the language really consistent with Common Core. For example, Common Core talks about rates and percents as subcategories of ratios. So as we've revised the lessons around ratios and proportional relationships, we've paid close attention to the language and made sure that it maps onto the Common Core standards and aligns completely. So when kids see things related to Common Core, the language is going to be seamless from everyday math to Common Core. The other thing that you see on this screen is a tape diagram which is, as you probably know, Common Core uses a lot of models and diagrams and really encourages that for problem solving and for modeling problems. So we've taken some of the diagrams from Common Core, field tested them, and found that this one was particularly successful with kids for solving problems around proportional relationships. So what you're seeing represents a three to two relationship. Let's say Gabriel has three pencils for every two pencils that Beverly has. Now the way the tape diagram works, if you forget about the numbers for just a minute, you can see that three to two relationship in the way the boxes are structured. Three boxes for Gabriel and two boxes for Beverly. Think about a context. So Gabriel has these three pencils for every two. Let's say Beverly has six pencils. The way the diagram works is I split her pencils up into equivalent groups that fill her boxes. So she's got three pencils in each box. In order to preserve that relationship of three to two, every box has to have the same number of pencils in it. So I go ahead and put three in each of Gabriel's boxes, and now I can see that nine to six preserves the relationship of three to two. So that's how we use tape diagrams. A second domain is the domain of number systems. And again, this has always been in everyday mathematics, but some of the things you'll now see in sixth grade used to exist in other grade levels in everyday math, and we've pulled it up into sixth grade so that it's fresh for sixth graders as they're working with Common Core. For example, the de density of rational numbers, where you think about two numbers on a number line, you're going to find numbers in between. In fact, you can find an infinite number of numbers between any two numbers on a number line. So we now work with this in sixth grade with both fractions and decimals. Something else in number systems is there's a lot of computation in Common Core. Computation, again, it's always been in everyday math, but it hasn't always been concentrated in sixth grade everyday math. So we've made sure to pull up the computation that's important in Common Core and revisit it in sixth grade. For example, fraction division is highlighted and all computation with decimals, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, both with alternative algorithms and also with US traditional algorithms. The computation stuff is introduced in early units in the program, and then we draw on that and use that as we problem solve through the last five, six units of the grade level. Finally, there's something in number systems which is actually new in everyday math, and that is working with absolute value. And the way it's structured is to think about absolute value as the distance of a number from zero, as opposed to thinking about the order of numbers on a number line. So for example, if you have negative 10 and positive 10, negative 10 is less than positive 10 when you're thinking about the order on the number line. But when you're thinking about the absolute value, which is the distance from zero, the absolute value of negative 10, or that distance, is 10. So it's equal to the distance of 10 from zero on the number line. And then students will apply this when they're thinking about, for example, the length of line segments on a coordinate grid. If you have vertically or horizontally positioned points, you can find the distance between them by thinking about the distance from the axis of each of the points. Moving on to the third major work domain, expressions and equations, once again, everyday math has always been really strong in this strand, really strong with kids thinking about what it means to have equivalent expressions. 
really strong in thinking about how kids generate equivalent equations and how they solve equations. And there are many strategies, the same strategies you've always seen in everyday math for solving equations. But there was one model in the Common Core Standards that was very successful in field testing, and that was the bar model. So this is now appearing in the program in lessons in sixth grade. The way the bar model works, you have an equation, 2p plus 21 equals 39. We set up the bar model by putting one of the expressions on the top part of the model and the expression on the other side of the equal sign on the bottom part of the model. And then we kind of match up sections. So for example, I have 21 in the top bar. I also have 21 in the bottom bar. I can think about the bottom bar as divided into a section of 18 and a section of 21, and I've lined up the 21s. Now I'm going to look at the two p's in the top part of the bar and the 18 in the bottom part. And if I divide that 18 into two equal sections, I can see that p equals 9. Again, a very successful model for students in solving equations. So now the two additional and supporting work domains. The first is data, is statistics and probability, or data concepts. And the focus in Common Core Standards is really on students analyzing the variability and the spread of data and what that means about the data set. So we've always spent a lot of energy on everyday math helping kids, uh, providing context for kids to think about data sets and to think about what representations of data mean and to construct representations of data. We still do all that in sixth grade, but now everything has been revised and geared towards that emphasis in Common Core Standards of thinking about variability. And there are a few new tools and diagrams that are used in everyday math at sixth grade. For example, histograms and box plots are used to represent data. Both of these are good visual images for thinking about the variability and the spread of the data. Also, interquartile range, which if you see that box on the box plot, if you want to know and think about the variability of the data, it helps to know about the length of that box, which represents 50% of the data set. So the interquartile range tells you something about the length of that box. Finally, we introduce mean absolute deviation, or MAD, where you actually are finding the average distances of all of the data points from the mean. This tells you if the data is all clustered around the mean, which means you'd have a very small mean absolute deviation, or whether the data points are spread out around the mean, which is going to give you a larger mean absolute deviation. And finally, we have the geometry domain. And the geometry domain is going to look pretty familiar, but we've spent a little more time emphasizing fractional edge lengths when we're calculating volume of prisms. And we've also spent more time thinking about how to construct a solid from a net and how to create the net for a geometric solid. And building on work that's done in earlier grades with decomposing shapes to find area, we now think about decomposing the solid into its net and think about the areas of each of the surfaces of the net for calculating surface area. 